All right. Uh, hopefully you guys got more sleep than I did last night. Um, so, uh, last time we were talking about uh, the leases, right? And what we said is you could do the conservative, you could do the optimistic, or you could do the minimax regret option. I want to throw one last decision-making option out there, um, and that is if you, instead of saying that they're equally probable, what happens if you have different probabilities that you, your different scenarios might encounter? So, uh, so let's say, I'm not going to rewrite our, our tables out all together here, but let's say that we have a probability of the low mileage, or the uh, 12,000 miles per year, is, uh, let's make that uh, 50%. All right? Uh, and let's say the medium, or the 15K per year, is 40%, and the high is at 18 per year is 10 percent. Okay? So now, we don't want to use any of the the minimax regret or the uh, conservative or optimistic scenarios in isolation because now we have some sort of likelihood that these scenarios might encounter. So what we're going to, to use instead is we're going to compute our expected value across each one of these scenarios right here. Alright? Do you guys remember how to compute the expected value from your statistics classes of uh, multiple options? No. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to multiply the probability of the event occurring times the, the weight of that different event. So um, we're going to create our, our new lease table here. All right. A, B, and C. And we're going to go low medium, and high, uh, and I'll rewrite these probabilities here, so the, to get the expected value, I'll make a separate thing for that, we're going to do, what is the expected value of A, B, and C? So, because this is the decision that we have to make. We don't get to choose what outcome happens, but we are going to say what we're expected to pay given these probabilities in each of these scenarios right here. So what we would do is we take our, um, our matrix which lists all the costs for e each of these things, and we would say, well, what does it cost for low mileage, 10764 times 50%. So 50% of the time, we're going to pay that $10,764 amount. 40% of the time, we're going to pay 12114 plus 10% of the time, we're going to pay 13000 464. So if we multiply each of these, these values here by the, the cost, the appropriate cost in each one of them here, and then we sum them together, we'll get the total expected value. So for, uh, if my calculations are correct, the expected value for lease A with these different uh, probabilities would be 11,574. 
All right. And if you repeat that process for at least B and we C, then you would get 11,340. And hopefully it should be no surprise, you don't even need a calculator to calculate row C, right? Why don't you need to calculate row C? It's the same so 50% and 40% and 10% are all going to add back up to your original 11,700, right? And that's a good check for you. And if you do that multiplication and sum and don't get back the number that makes sense, you know you're probably doing something wrong accidentally, right? So according to our expected value criteria, which lease would you recommend? Because? Is the uh, lowest expected value, right. which is the lowest cost. Lowest cost, which is what our objective was, right? We want to minimize the cost that we incur under each of these leasing scenarios. Yes, Dan. Um, so the percentage is uh, interchangeable, right? So like, let's say the low was like 30, uh -huh. uh, then that would be like a different case. Yeah, that would be a different okay. case. Okay. Yeah, if you, if you had 30, um, 30, and uh, 40, that would give you a, a different amount because you'd be multiplying these probabilities uh, at at different values against the, the fixed values in, in here. Yeah. And the goal is to try to just basically get the lowest uh, expected value. Yeah, uh, the goal is given the pro probability. So okay. you you don't get to choose your probabilities, right? Because if you could choose your probabilities, you yeah, would <laughs> that that would be like the optimistic scenario. Right. Right? All a hundred percent low, right? <laughs> I'm gonna choose that. Or it could be like the conservative value. I'm going to 100% choose this because that's going to give me the, the worst case scenario. Right? But um, there's going to be some reason why you have these probabilities in mind. Maybe it's because you can look at past history and say in the past, this is what's happened, so this is what's likely to happen in the future. Obviously, it's not a guarantee, but that might be it. Maybe you've got some forecasting model. We're not going to talk about that in this class, but there's a whole chapter in your book on how to do forecasting well. Okay, And so you might, um, you might do that. Uh, those, some of you may have taken already operations management or are planning on taking that. That's a big component of that type of a class. right? You need to be able to forecast what your inventory is going to look like and be able to manage it uh, appropriately. So you might have some other model somewhere telling you these are what the probabilities are going to occur for each of these scenarios. And so you're plugging it now in to your decision-making analysis to be able to say, given that it's uh, provided me with these probabilities, we think that the best solution uh, is, is this right here. All right. Now, what I want to be clear about as we're going through this chapter is I don't want to say this is the decision-making strategy that you should be using. And it's far superior to any other strategy that you're going to encounter. Rather, what I want you to say is these are all good, valid strategies that you need to understand what they mean, what the implications of them are, and to understand how they all kind of mutually inform a, a decision. You know, it, it can be really reassuring if you say, from all these different vantage points, they all say that this is the decision that you make. That's really awesome and nice. It probably doesn't work out that way very frequently. So you want to know why this decision-making strategy suggests taking one option, and this other decision-making strategy takes a, another. And you need to maybe fit it into the scenario that you're encountering. And one of your homework assignments that's coming up has to do with a politician who is um, concerned about his reelectability. So because uh, reelectability is a concern for him, he has different priorities on what is a bad outcome or, or, or a good outcome because of that. So you're going to look at all these decision-making strategies, but you're going to say, this decision-making strategy most closely aligns with your ability to become re-elected. Okay? So you need to understand for the decision-maker what their priorities are and why they are. And don't uh, just assume that 
you know, minimax regret or expected value or um, <clears throat> conservative or, or whatever isn't always going to be the right idea. And I want you to do that, especially when you're thinking about your final report for, for the class. You're going to be looking at three different ways to redistrict your state. Um, and I want you to evaluate it along all of the different decision-making strategies that we're talking about here. We think this is the conservative case for the Republicans. This is the optimistic case for the Democrats. This is the minimax regret. This is the expected value, and so forth. And because we understand all of that, we and, and look at them as a whole, we make this overall suggestion for, for the state to follow. Excuse me. Is a quick question. Yes. Uh, I don't mean to like puzzle what you just said right now. Yes. Is it possible for you to like okay, so you know we're collecting data on like the presidency and stuff like that? Yes. Is it possible for us to predict based off of what you, the uh is it the conservative and the different uh method uh -huh. to, to predict who would win the next as you mean, you have like the 30%, the 40%, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, could you use what what we've collected in this class as an election model? Okay. It's probably not robust, robust enough because there aren't a lot of elections. Uh, if, you, if you think about how many pieces of data you've collected, it's maybe 10 or 15. And some of the pieces of data that you collected are highly correlated with each other. So for instance, the 2016 presidential election and the 2016 Senate election in, in your state probably had very similar numbers to each other. Um, unless there is a really good or bad candidate in that election, there's, there is high correlation between those two values. So collecting those two values gives a little bit of extra data, but it doesn't give a ton of, of extra data to, to your model. Um, and so you would want to augment it with other pieces of, of data. And that's why if you look at people who have been predicting uh, yesterday's election up until today, they augment it with things like what is the economic forecast. Mm -hmm. and, and now then you start asking, well, how do you predict what the economy is? Is it the stock market? Is it the jobs report? Is it, um, you can you know, pick whatever. They, they include things like polling, asking people what they're, they're going to, to do for, for their vote. Um, and um, uh, you, you want to add as many of those kind of inputs into your system as possible to do the, the best uh, possible job yeah. that, that you can. Excuse me. Um, so let's quickly, uh, if you can, uh, turn, open your books and turn to um, problem 13-2. Um, it's an artificial problem, it's not a word problem. I will, I will write it up on the board. Yeah, you guys haven't gotten used to bringing your books to class because you haven't had to come to class very much. Right? Okay, so this column right here are going to be the decisions. So decision one, two, three, and four. And across the top are the states of nature. All right? And these are um, arbitrary numbers, since it's an artificial problem, which means we can use these numbers in two different contexts. So what I want to start with is assuming that these numbers are um, Let's call them profits to start. After we go through our decision making exercise, I'll just call them costs. Okay? So, what I'd like you to do, given this matrix of all the decisions that you have available, 
you can um, get together with another person or work on your own and go through the, the three strategies um, that we talked about. The optimistic, the conservative, and the minimax regret. And say what each one of those decision-making strategies would do with this particular chaotic matrix. Still talking, uh, but let's let's start, and I'll let you work a little bit more in a second. Let's start with the easy ones. Optimistic. What decision are you going to make if you're making an optimistic decision? Do you want? Why? You can get 14. Because you can get 14, right? That's and so it, because this is a profit, we're doing the maxi max, right? We're taking the maximum value here. Maximum value here, maximum value here, and the maximum value here. And we choose the maximum of all of those values right there. So our optimistic is D1. What's the conservative? D3. D3. Why? We have to do a little bit more work for the conservative, right? So it's not maxi max, but it is maxi min. Maxi min. So we first have to pick the minimum across each of these, right? Because we're worried about what the worst case scenario might be. Right, so the worst case scenario here is five. The worst case scenario here, seven, nine, and eight. And then what do we want to do? We want to maximize that, and so that's why it is D3. Right, so this is maxi max, this is maxi min. All right. Why did I start drawing this table right here? We got to do regret. Yeah, we need to do the regret. So we need to compute what the regret is. So how do we do that? So if we're making this decision right here, we want 
What was the best outcome that could happen if we chose decision one? State of nature one. So that's going to be our zero, right? Zero regret. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I, I should word this better here. If this is what happens, if the state happens, which decision do we prefer? We prefer that we had made decision one, right? Because the state of nature is outside of our control. Yes. Right? So if this happens, we would have preferred to have made this decision right here. But what happens if we had made this decision right here? Our regret is how much? Three. Three. Or five. five. Or six. Okay, but now we repeat that same scenario across this state. Okay, then you just subtract the person from the other one. Yes, we're subtracting because this is the best thing decision we could have made okay. if this scenario took place. Okay. And so we wouldn't have any regret here. We made the most money we possibly could have made. But here, if this is what took place, we made decision two. And this is what the outcome was. We would have wished, we would have said, oh, if only I would have made decision one, right? Mm -hmm. I could have made three billion dollars. I don't know what the, the units are, right? I really would have liked to have done that in, instead of this. And so that's, re, that's an expression of our regret. Okay, regret the yeah, okay. So in, if, if state number two happens, which decision will we have wished we had done? Anything but D1, right? So there's there's no regrets here, and the regret here is one. How about state three? Which decision would we have wished we had done? D4, right? Because that's where we could make our largest profit right here. What's our regret if instead we had made decision one? Okay, and then finally, state four. What decision would we have liked to have done? D4. So that's going to have zero regret here. It's going to have eight, six, two. Okay, so now that we've computed our regret, now we're in the same uh, spot as we heard here, right here, right? We want to we want to minimax or maximize regret. So what's the just like here we said? What's the worst case scenario that could happen? What's the worst case regret we could encounter in here? We could plan here, right? How about with decision two? Six. Decision three. Five. And decision four. Six. Okay, and now what do we want to do? We want to minimize our worst possible regret. And so that's going to choose decision three. All right. Let's do quickly the opposite of this now. Treat these same numbers instead of as profits, but as costs that you're incurring. Okay? Same matrix, different interpretation of the numbers. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
scenario now if we treat these values as costs instead of as profit? Still D1. Still D1 because now instead of the 14, it's the minimum cost that we could encounter right here. All right. How about conservative? Now what should we do? Instead of figuring out what the worst case scenario is being the lowest, our worst case scenario now is the highest. So what's the highest encountered cost we might be? 14, 11, 11, okay, so in this scenario, we're going to say either D2 or D3, right? It doesn't differentiate between those decisions. This is one reason why you might want to have multiple decision making uh, strategies. Okay, and then our minimax regret. For scenario one, what do we want to happen? D4. We want this lowest cost right here, right? So that's going to be the zero regret, and then we subtract again. So 14 minus 8 is 6, 11 minus 8 is 3, 1, and 0. What's our best case scenario now for state of nature 2? It's here, and the regret is that, right? How about state of nature 3? What's the best case scenario? And then it's 2, 2, and 3. And our best case scenario in state 4 is up here, right? Then we get 2, 6, and 8. And then we actually do the same thing once we have our regret, because now these are in the same um, meaning, right? We don't want regret. So we go and we get our highest value here is 6. Our highest value here is 3. Our highest value here is 6. And our highest value here is 8. And so based on that, our minimax regret says that we should choose decision two, because it's the least likely to give us a high amount of regret. All right? How many people did bring books today? Great. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to turn my book to problem 10. And I'll see if I can get it to project very well on the screen. So 13, 10, what I'm trying to do. I'll try to make it as readable as I can here on the screen.
okay. And you probably would like to see the actual stuff on screen. Starting right here. What I'd like to do with this problem is introduce what we call a decision tree um, and show how probability applies to it. So what decision are we trying to make with this problem? Whether the market Battle Pacific or Space Pirates. Okay, so we have a decision between two options. Right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that we have a decision point here. And option number one, D1, is, I will just write here, um, and option two right here, right? Those are the two options that we have available to us. Now, <coughs> They have slightly different scenarios, right? Battle Pacific has less numbers in here than Space Pirates does. Why does why is there um, why is there more here in the Space Pirates side of things? Because we have to deal with competition. So there are two that are called. Um, chance events that are outside of our control. Whereas with Battle Pacific, there's only one chance event, that being the demand. With Space Pirates, in addition to the demand, we also have to deal with the competition or the non-competition. All right? So for Battle Pacific, there are three basic outcomes, different states of nature S1, S2. that could occur. <clears throat> um, with space pirates, we actually have to reflect that there's competition and there's no competition right here. And then after we reflect that, each one of them have three possible outcomes associated with them. Okay? Does the, the first um, setup of the diagram make sense based on the description of the problem? Okay, now what we need to do is we need to take the values from this problem and put them into our decision tree. There are two things that we need to put in the tree. One is the value of the outcome, and that's going to show up at what we call the leaves of the tree, or the very tips of, of the, the tree. Um, and then the other thing we have to do is where do they talk about it? is we have to deal with the probabilities that these will, will encounter. 
Okay, so let's start with the, the outcome here. Um, so I'm going to label them because S1, S2, and S3 don't make a lot of sense in the abstract. And so I'm going to go low, medium, and high. And I'll do the same thing, low, medium, and high. Low, medium, and high. All right? So help me out, because at this angle, I can't read the thing. So what is the outcome that we will encounter with Battle Pacific with, if there's low demand? $300. This isn't thousands of dollars, but I'll keep it that. $300, okay? How about for medium demand? And high demand? Okay, so competition. Which of these two are we going to look at here? The top one, okay? So if we have a low competition, what's that? 200. Medium? 100. And high? 800. What about if we don't have competition? Uh, 400, 800, 600. All right. So that gets us these values right here, the dollar values, but what we haven't put in are these probabilities right here. And I like to put the probabilities rather than at the tips, I like to actually put them on the edges themselves so it's really clear that we're talking about that decision. So what's the probability that we will have low demand for Battle Pacific? 0.3. Uh, 0.5. 0.2. And they need to add up to 100%, right? How about uh, here, low, medium, high? 0 0.3, 0.4, and 0.3. Uh, 0.2, 0.3, and 0.9. Alright, now we have all the data from our table into our decision tree. This is a probabilistic one. Um, let's go. So we, we have all four decision making scenarios available to us. Okay, let's go through them each and, and see where, where they um, are. So let's start with our optimistic scenario. What's the most optimistic scenario we're going to encounter? Outcome we're going to encounter? Right here, right? So I'll just put. Um, optimistic, right? That's the maximum outcome which we want since this is profit. How about our conservative scenario? How do we do this conservative scenario along here? Well, what we do is in this decision tree, we say what's the worst case that can happen, right? But what's the worst case that can happen? Low demand. Low demand, yeah, right? In this part of the tree, what's the worst case that could happen? Competition, low demand. Competition and low demand. So from a, a conservative viewpoint, we would see the outcome of Battle Pacific being 300. We would see the outcome of Space Pirates as being 200. We want to maximize that. So we would pick... Battle Pacific here, right? So you don't factor in the fact that they're that about whether or not there's competition. You just take it at wholesale. Right, right. Because, right. It, because the competition, just like the demand, is outside of your gotcha. control. Um, your control. You don't control what your whether some other company is going to produce a competing product. Right. And so because of that, you're looking. Well, what's the what's the worst case scenario that could happen? It could be that those things both go against you. Okay. Is, this, is this conservative? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to skip Minimax Regret for a second here. Um, 
Hey, Taz, I want to just do the tree and then I'll come back to the next Quick one. question. Hi, yeah. Miss, what was your logic with uh, 1600 for the uh, optimistic? Sorry. Because with the optimistic, we say what is the best possible outcome that could occur? For this decision, the best possible outcome is 1,000. The best possible outcome for this decision is 1,600. Okay. And then we say we'll take the best possible outcome from from each decision okay. and choose it. The conservative, you add the 200 and 400 compared to the 300 for the... No, you compare the 300 and the 200. Because those are the worst options okay. that could occur. Okay. I'm saying like for the competition to compare like the but you don't SP. compare these because oh. this is not a decision. Okay. This is a chance event, right? It's something outside of your control. You didn't choose whether or not to have competitions because of course we <laughs> if we could make the choice we'd have no competition. Right? This is something that just happens to you and you don't get to control that. Okay. But I'm saying in terms of you choosing 300, was, was the reason why? Because 200, um, you added 200 and 400, which, no? No. For the conversation, no? You, you choose, for this decision, oh, gotcha, gotcha. for this decision, they're, they're separate like this, right? Yeah. So, up here, you choose the worst outcome possible, okay. which is 300. 300 okay. For down here, you choose the worst outcome that's possible, which is 200. And then you say, well, I don't want 200. I'd rather have 300. And so you make this decision up here. OK. OK. Oh, because the max can mean, OK. All right. Let's do the expected value. So the way the expected value works is that each chance node, we're going to say, what is the expected value of that node? So we're just going to look, for instance, well, let's do this, because we don't have multiple chance events right here. What is the expected value of this? Well, we, what we do, what we say we do? 23 times 300. Right, we multiply the probabilities times the out, of outcome, so we get 0 0.3 times 300. What do we do next? plus 0.5 times 700 plus 0.2 times 1,000. So this is um, 90 plus 350 plus 200, which is 640. Okay? So we say the value of this, no the expected value of that node is 640. We expect that on average, if we made this decision many, many times, we would average over all those cases $640,000 of profit. <clears throat> we do the same thing right here, but we start and we just compute the expected value of this node right here. We don't jump here right away. We have to do this node first, right? And we compute this node the same way as we did computing this node right here. So we would do 0 0.3 times 200 plus 0.4 times 400 plus 0.3 times 800. So here you would get 60 plus 160 plus 240, which equals um, 460. So the expected value of that node is 460. Now we repeat this process a third time for this node right here. 0 0.2 times 400 plus 0 0.3 times 800 plus 0 0.5 times 1600. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, this is uh, 20. No, 80 plus 240 plus 800, which is uh, 1120. 
now is where I double check my map. Yep. Okay. Now we need to figure out the value of this node right here. How do we do that? Um, that would be true if what was the case? Right. If they were fifty percent chance. Right. There is um it is. Where does it say that? I think it's B. B, yeah. Look, uh, right here. It's really hard to, to see. So there's a 60% probability that there is competition. So just like we labeled each of these with a probability, we're going to label these edges with the probability. What blocks here, of course? Okay? And now, we repeat the same idea as we did for these nodes. What we do is we multiply the probability not across all these, because we've already done that, but according to the expected value of that node right there. We already know what the expectation that we're, is if we encounter that node, so we don't have to keep drilling down for that competition, uh, computation. So we get 0 0.6 times 460 plus 0 0.4 times 1120. And now my uh, mental math facilities are, are shot. And we get, I don't have the intermediate result for now. 724. Okay, so the expected value of this node is 724. All right, so given that computation for the expected value, which decision would we choose? We're going to choose this one, right? Because we want a higher expected value. So, you know, I'm going to erase these because this is kind of deceiving. I should have done optimistic here because that's where the decision is being made. I should have put conservative here. And now we have our expected value here. So the optimistic and the expected values say that we should choose building uh, space pirates. Uh, the conservative one says that we should choose Battle Pacific. Right. And then the fourth one that we would look at if we had additional time is to do the minimax regret. So what you would do is you would enumerate all your different states and, and say, um, what is the possible regret that, that you would have in that scenario? So for that one, you would have BP, and then you would have SP with competition, and FP without competition. Is uh -huh. three different states in nature at that point? No, they're each one of these are oh, sorry. different oh, states in okay. nature, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so you have three states here, um, or you could see this as representing both with competition and without competition. Right? And so you could repeat this in your table two times. So you have six possible states. Um, demand times competition across two different decisions. Okay. So you have 12 total entries in your, in your table. All right? Um, I think this is the last uh, session that I didn't have recorded previously, so the videos are back on, on track and uh, on YouTube. I hope to put this up online even by the end of the day today. Um, so classes will go back to the normal, hey, come in, ask questions or clarifications, 
on both the homework and the final project. Okay? So um, I'm sorry that you, I kind of forced you into that show up mode here this, this, this week, um, but I'm, I'm glad you were able to accommodate that. Have a great day, everyone. I'll see you next.